There are over 700,000 sexual offenders in the United States alone. With all the social media these days, how can we protect ourselves and our children from these despicable predators? Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast, where we discuss criminal cases that involve some factor of abuse. Our goal is to spread awareness of abuse that could be taking place around any of us and encourage everyone to take responsibility and report if they see a child or an adult being abused. Robbie Wayne was a young boy from Pecan Grove, Texas. His mother Lana had many relationships during his childhood and he never really had a stable father figure. That is until Harry Dowd started dating his mother. This man was here to stay. But things didn't get any better for Robbie. After several weeks of a tumultuous relationship between the two in Texas, Harry, Lana, Robbie, and Harry's daughter Wendy all packed up the car and headed off to start a new life in Oklahoma. But as they were leaving a rest stop, a couple named Gladys and Frank Chapman noticed some strange things about Robbie Wayne. Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast. I'm Ryan. And I'm Rosie. And today we are continuing Robbie Wayne. Uh, if This is part two of Robbie Wayne, so if you haven't heard part one yet, we definitely recommend that you go listen to that first. Mm-hmm. Um, and before we start talking about the case, we want to uh, give a shout out and a thank you to Justin from The Peripheral, because mm-hmm. this week he put together an amazing episode. Um, Rosie, you haven't had a chance to listen to the whole thing yet because you've been at work, but um, it at the very end, mm-hmm. Aaron had a section mm-hmm. where he talked a little bit and just about being kind to people, not even just podcasters, but um, just in general being looking for ways to be kind to people and if you do have criticisms for them um you know being up building and not not just being mean about it and if you don't know who aaron is he's from the podcast generation y yeah aaron and justin are both we decided we wanted to make our own i mean who doesn't know generation y they're like like podcast celebrities if you're listening (laughs) to us you know who generation y is but um so anyway I definitely recommend you go listen to Justin's Peripheral mm-hmm. episode 50 cuz there's a lot of podcasters in it that share their personal experiences with um receiving hate and just unnecessary rudeness from listeners and we had a, a little part in it so Yeah, it was really cool. And because of that, I'm we've had our biggest um yeah, listen, listen bro- day. Broke our record for downloads today. So thank you so much for uh, including us in that. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. Uh, and Justin. Also, thank you to our Patreon. What do we call them Patreon. patrons or Patreons? Well, they're patrons Yeah. on Patreon. Okay, so. so thank you to our patrons. Um, we've really been appreciating you guys. And we got a new one last week, so that's been really awesome too. And if you enjoy the show as much as they do, <laughs> please consider being a patron and being part of our Patreon family. Yep, because we have... Uh, We have a lot of cool things you can get from it, and we also have some premium episodes on the way. Mm -hmm. They're not out yet, but we promise they're coming. So let's continue Robbie Wayne. All right. Before we begin, this story is, like, insanely sad. Like, we should have a discretion. Yeah, definitely. If you listened to the last episode, you know that Mm -hmm. um, if you're sensitive to this, you probably shouldn't be listening, but... Hopefully, if you haven't heard part one, you'll go listen to it, and you'll know that it's a very difficult story to hear and to talk about. So when we left off, the family was on their way to Oklahoma on a road trip. So Right, and once the family arrived in Oklahoma, Dowd began job hunting, and he found a job with a construction firm only after three days. Yeah, which was impressive given his... Mm -hmm. former record of not working at all (laughs) being in the middle of the school year they realized that they should probably enroll the kids but when they visited the school harry would only enroll wendy later on lana told dowd that she wanted to get robbie back into kindergarten but when she brought it up he flew into a rage and shouted are you crazy do you want the oklahoma social workers to come nosing around here yeah that's 
if you're responding like that just to your kid being enrolled in school, there's probably a serious issue. But yeah. Their first week in Oklahoma was relatively typical, besides Robbie not being in school. Dowd was going to work, and Wendy was going to school, and Lana stayed home with Robbie and the baby in their mobile home in the southwestern trailer park. Yep, but after only three days on the job, um, Harry came home from work limping and whining about pain. He told Lana, I hurt my damn leg again, but the doctor says there's nothing wrong. That sounds familiar. That's what he said last time. Mm -hmm. I told them... This is speaking about his bosses. I told them what they could do with their job. I'm not going back. What a piece of crap man. I mean, he's he's one of those guys that's just freaking lazy and doesn't want to go to work. So he'll find any way to get out of it. I wonder what he did. It's like, I know it probably wasn't anything. He was just saying that. Yeah. Or what he did was really minor. But I'm well, I know curious. construction work can, I mean... You can get hurt, but there's lots of construction workers that... Oh, yeah. I mean, they might get slightly hurt, and they keep working through some no, pain. No, I'm not saying construction works like you don't get hurt. I'm just saying because of his reputation. Oh, oh yeah, I know. Say. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Harry was seething with rage against his former construction boss, who was unsympathetic, and the doctor told him that there was nothing wrong. <laughs> and so, once again, Harry was unemployed. After three days... Three days of this job, and he stayed home every day, not doing anything to provide for his family. So since Robbie wasn't going to school, he was at home with Harry. This is so ridiculous, because Dowd seems to be obsessed with the boy's education, making him recite his numbers and letters all the time, and punishing him if he couldn't. But if he actually was that concerned about it, he would not He would have sent him to school and don't forget, this is all started because he wanted to prove to social workers that Robbie was well off in this house in an attempt to cover up the abuse that he had been inflicting on the child. So yeah. it's such a crazy cycle. I was just thinking that too, how the main goal got totally thrown out the window. Yeah, it's like, what's the point of these recitals mm -hmm. if you're not going to even send him to school? Right. Well, while the two were at home together, Harry became determined to get Robbie to count to 100 by 1s, 5s, and 10s. Again, why? He's not going to school. But anyway, he also wanted him um, to spell his name. Not Robbie Wayne, but Robbie Dowd. Yeah, so he's forcing the boy to use his last name, um, even though he's not the father. And I don't believe he was even married to Robbie's mother, so what's up with that? They fell into a bit of a routine where Harry would order the boy to count, then Robbie would refuse, then Dowd would spank him until he started counting. Then if Robbie ever got stuck on a number, he would get spanked again. So these were obviously not normal spankings with a hand. First, Dowd would use a little switch. Um, which, which I've always equated with whipping more than spanking. Right. And then he switched to half an inch thick board that was two feet long and four inches wide. Huh. That sounds really <clears throat> overboard. Mm hmm Not to, that was not meant to be a pun. I was but just <laughs> it's, it's too much. There's no, uh, I don't yeah. think a kid can do anything to warrant being smacked with a, basically a two by four. Yeah, that's. Okay, that's what I'm thinking in my head. That's pretty much what it would be, but thinner. Well, right? it was two feet long, four, four inches wide, so it was probably more like a one by eight. Okay. Or what? Um, or just, it's a thin piece of wood. Yeah. Um, Lana was also home all the time during this period, and she would make small efforts here and there to try to get Dowd to let up on the boy, but these efforts were very inconsistent, and at times she would swing the paddle herself. Yeah, Gosh. This jerk was so lazy that he figured out a way to enact this extreme punishment without even needing to get out of his chair. He would make Robbie come over and stand right in front of him and then make Robbie bend over and hold his ankles. Well, yeah, he hurt his leg at work. <laughs> yeah, he can't get up. But he would make Robbie do this, and then he would hold the paddle with both hands like you'd hold oh a baseball gosh. bat mm -hmm. and swung it so hard that often it would knock uh, Robbie down. Oh, yeah. 
And Harry, he wasn't a little dude. He was a 245-pound man at the time. So obviously, he's going to be pretty intimidating. These beatings happened between three and six times per day and got worse in time. And so did Harry's ideas. He began shutting Robbie in the closet of the children's bedroom. It was only two feet wide by five feet tall. That is tiny. Almost a foot shorter than me. Uh So he couldn't... I mean, there wasn't much room in there. No, there was no light, no windows, no ventilation. And Dowd would monitor the closet door closely, making sure that Robbie wasn't trying to get out. And when he caught Robbie trying to stretch out, he would force him to stand up for long periods of time. Ugh, gross. So for the first three days of this new little tactic that he came up with, Robbie was only brought out of the closet to eat with his family at dinner time. And they were super broke because Harry was a whiny, wimpy, selfish jerk who didn't make any effort to work through any discomfort. And, I mean, most people realize work can be a challenge sometimes, but not him, obviously. So, anyway, because they were so poor, their meals were mainly oatmeal, beans, or macaroni. So, they're not really getting much nutrition. Mm -hmm. But after three days, they started leaving him in the closet while the rest of them ate. Then he was let out to eat if there were any leftovers. If there were no leftovers, which probably happened a lot, he was just given a glass of water and two teaspoons of sugar. Ugh. What? Wha- Who came up with that rule? That sugar, it's super calorie dense, but a teaspoon only has 16 calories in it. So this boy was only getting 32 calories of absolutely nutritionless food per day. And remember, he was only in kindergarten. It wasn't like he had years and years of fat storage to live off of. He was absolutely starving. Mm -hmm. Rosie, will you tell us the effects of malnutrition in a child? Yeah. Well, first, just thinking in my head while you were talking about that, he's like, let's just break it down and you're in the closet. You're like stuck in this prison cell without any communication with anybody, without light a window to look at you're completely bored you're not doing anything no activity and he's a little kid too like how i can't even imagine like his thought process the depression he's going through and then being starved yeah sugar and the sad part is that as a small child like this what the adults in your life do become normal for you Mm -hmm. like or you start to think you deserve it. I'm, just, and, I'm thinking of Clayton. You remember the Oprah? Oh, Clayton you? Moss. Clayton yeah. Moss, who the kid who was stuck in a closet. You guys look it up on YouTube. We'll, we'll probably Oprah. talk about him at some point. I know. I just I'm seeing a lot of similarity. Yeah. Because he had siblings too. It's it. terrifying how many cases there are where parents make it lock is. their children in a closet. It is. But uh, to get back on track. Yeah, so malnutrition in a, t- in a child. Mm-hmm. Rosie, uh, you want to talk about that? Right. Well, the effects would be fatigue, dizziness, poor immune function, which can harm the body's ability to fight off infections, dry, scaly skin, swollen and bleeding gums, decaying teeth, slowed reaction times, and trouble paying attention, obviously being underweight, poor growth, muckle- muscle weakness, bloated stomach, Osteo, oh, I can never say, osteoporosis <laughs> or fragile bones that break easily and problems with organ functions, uh, also problems learning. Well, these are all terrible. If his bones are becoming weak and he's getting hit by a board six times a day, how many fractures are happening and going untreated? And also the last one really stood out to me problems learning because Mm -hmm. harry's incessantly trying to get robbie to learn his numbers and letters Mm -hmm. but he's not nurturing a healthy child and a healthy brain to be able to absorb this and learn how can you focus how would you be able to focus enough on two teaspoons of sugar per day to count to five uh, as a little kid you know like it just doesn't make sense i know if you were on an elliptical machine, you'd burn off 32 mm-hmm. calories in, like, two minutes. Yeah. I mean, none of it should make sense because it's not natural. It's not the way we should act. But it is, from a healthy standpoint, hard to even fathom this story. Yeah. And by the way, the figure I just gave was completely out of my butt. 
I don't know if that's actually true. (laughs) The more abuse Robbie received, the less compliant he became, which would make sense. He had no energy and probably was losing his will to live, as any of us would in this situation. And what difference did it really make if he did put in the effort? He was used to putting in effort, and look where he ended up. Mm -hmm. Again, Harry came up with another horrible idea. In an attempt to get Robbie to count by... Uh, or two 100 by fives, he filled up the bathtub with water to the top, and then he dragged Robbie from the closet to the bathroom. He commanded Robbie to count to 100 by fives, and when Robbie stumbled at 15, Dowd shouted at him, You dumbbell! You never learn! Then he picked up the boy, threw him into the bathtub, and held his head under the water. Ugh. That that is torture. Yeah. That's... Dumbbell. That's such a stupid name. <laughs> it was the 70s. I guess it was. Okay, so when he brought him back up, he demanded the same thing. And the same scenario played out again. He held Robbie underwater until the boys started fighting to come up to take a breath. Then Dowd dragged him back to the closet and threw him in. So basically, uh. Robbie is being kept in this closet all the time. Except at night when he would sneak out and stretch and grab some food because he was literally starving. This reminds me of the children of Anne Hamilton Byrne. I think they did this same form of torture. Um, who she's? If you don't know, she's a cult leader. We talked about uh, was it episode thirteen? I don't remember. But the hunger becomes so overwhelming that you're literally willing to do anything to get food. He's not even like doing anything crazy. He's just leaving the room to get it. You know, like yeah. But in, in that situation, that's like. The craziest thing you can do, I guess. Uh, Let's go against your mom's boyfriend's wishes, I guess. Uh, This poor kid, he just couldn't catch a break. Harry noticed that food was missing, so he nailed the closet door shut and Robbie was locked up. This led to Robbie peeing his pants when nobody was around to bend the nail back when he had to use the bathroom. Robbie wet his pants and Harry got so enraged that he forbade the child to drink any water this is so stupid i can't believe anyone could think this was okay i don't I think mean, he did think it was okay i thought he at this point he just he just decided i'm gonna torture this boy yeah and that's just the way it is i think he was thinking at all that robbie was human anymore robbie was just uh, a thing I mean, a healthy human can only go three to four days without water, and Robbie was already malnutritious. Mm -hmm. Just a a poor, helpless boy. It's so sad. It is. Um, The abuse continued to get worse. Dowd found an old extension cord, and the socket end of it was broken, so he cut it off and plugged the other end into the wall. Then, after the boy faltered at his numbers, Harry touched the exposed wire to the boy's arm, and the shock was so powerful and knocked oh. Robbie down. Oh my God. Dowd picked up the boy and stuck the wire on his skin again and again. He did this until Robbie was actually relieved to be shoved back into the closet. Sad. Yeah, hard to read, hard to say out loud, but he did. When Lana and Harry were out of the house and it was just Robbie and Wendy at home, Robbie would beg Wendy for food. She would usually sneak some food to him, risking getting in trouble with her father. Dowd only fed Robbie about every three days, usually cold oatmeal with nothing on it, a can of hominy, which Robbie hated, or a spoonful of beans or potatoes. None of these foods have much nutritional value, and the boy started showing signs of his abuse. He lost 15 to 20 pounds. His ribs and shoulder blades stuck out, and his stomach appeared swollen. Like we mentioned in the in the symptoms of starvation, he was pale and he felt weak. He would shake involuntarily almost all the time, and he had to hold his pants up with both hands to keep them from falling down. I just picture this little boy. He's living with two parents that should be taking care of him, but he's starving and neglected, and his pants won't even stay on. I'm wondering why. People that know that they've moved aren't, like, calling and, like, oh, can we talk to Robbie or, you know, like, anybody? Doesn't anybody know that he's around? It seems like they were one of those families with not many connections Mm -hmm. to people. 
Yeah, I guess so. But, oof. Well, if you're thinking it would be difficult to hide something like this while living in a trailer court community, you're not alone. I mean, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, trailer, trailers and trailer courts are usually pretty close to each other. Yeah, close proximity. But their neighbors didn't really know much about them because Dowd hated and feared company. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder why. But, I mean, that answers what you just brought up. They, yeah. They hate, hated company. How can you not have a couple of friends? I don't know. It's uh, kind of weird. Sounds boring. But he forbade Lana and Wendy from inviting anyone into the trailer, and he never had friends, and he wanted to keep it that way. Mm. And this could be why he's such a piece of human trash. He has no empathy because he has very limited human relationships, which interacting with other humans is how we learn empathy, you know? Mm-hmm. Though she was Harry's biological daughter, Wendy was the opposite. She was social and helpful, and the neighbors often saw her hanging diapers or running errands and was viewed as industrious and polite. She knew that what was happening to Robbie was wrong, but she was Daddy's little girl. She was Harry's loyal, adoring slave. She would not and maybe could not betray him. Brad Thomas was the owner of the trailer court they lived in. There was a time that he was working in his office, and he happened to look out the window and saw Wendy carrying an extremely pale, emaciated boy who appeared too weak to stand by himself. He said, I assume the boy was retarded or something, and that the little girl was doing her best to help him. Unfortunately, that was the end of it, and he never told anyone about it. None of the other residents ever heard anything suspicious. So this here's another missed opportunity like we talked about last week with the I mm-hmm. uh, can't remember the name of the people in the car but that saw him at the park and ride yeah or the rest area and didn't decided not to call yeah but, well, when you're mentally disabled does that automatically make you look like you're on the brink of death like <laughs> I don't get his I don't think so his point there I know But shortly after this, uh, Harry came up with another heinous punishment. He demanded Robbie to count to 100, and the boy missed 11, and Dowd pushed him onto his hands and knees, tied a string around one of his front teeth, and then tied the other end to a doorknob. He made Wendy hold the boy while he and Lana slammed the door. And the tooth was not loose at all, so it didn't come out on the first try. They slammed the door several times, and it finally tore out of Robbie's mouth. And it had to be so painful. Have a tooth torn out that wasn't supposed to come out yet. Uh, Lana, what what is she doing? I know, it's shocking. Uh. The, The mother would be complicit and actually participate in this abuse. Robbie shivered as Dowd demanded he count again, but the boy just couldn't do it. This time, Lana attached the string to the boy's other front tooth. They slammed the door three times before the second tooth came out. The next day, they took Robbie and told him they were going to teach him how to count, but somehow this involved them pulling two more of his teeth in the same manner. While they were doing this, they fractured his jaw, but they didn't even know it. This is, like, hard to read. <laughs> I know. Um, Are you okay? Yeah, this is, I just feel really bad for him. As they approached him with the string, for the fifth tooth, his mouth was bleeding, but he started counting, and he did it flawlessly this time. Dowd began to laugh at him, saying, If you could recite like that all the time, you wouldn't have such things happen to you. But even after Robbie accomplished this, He was thrown back into the closet with a bloody mouth and no food or water. So, this part, this is what really, really gets me, is after all this, he, Robbie was able to do what Harry wanted him to do this whole time, Mm -hmm. but he still got thrown back into the closet, starving, thirsty, and bleeding. They didn't even treat him. I'm sure he was bleeding a lot. Yeah, having I'm, four teeth ripped out of your... I'm not even. I'm not surprised at all. Because it wasn't about counting at this point. Yeah. It was just about what else can we do to it. That's a good point. Yeah, it wasn't about it, making him learn anymore. Yeah. 
And now we want to pause to share another podcast with you that we think you might enjoy if you like our show. Hello all, I'm Paul, creator and host of the True Crime Enthusiast podcast. I've been a crime buff for many years now and my enthusiasm has led its way here. If you fancy each week delving into some obscure but in-depth and often disturbing true crime tales from the shores of the UK, plus you don't mind the northern accents and the down-to-earth manner, then why not come have a nosy? The show can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and pretty much wherever you get your podcasts from. So it'd be great if you guys could come and have a look-see and I hope you can subscribe today. I'd love you to join me and I look forward to seeing you there too. See if you can become enthusiastic about the True Crime Enthusiast podcast. And now back to the show. On Saturday, July 8th, 1978, Lana was starting her new job at a cafeteria. She had to leave early. The trailer was a mess. There were dirty dishes and laundry everywhere, and the baby was fussy. It was driving Harry crazy. He commanded Wendy to get busy cleaning the place. But she was into a book and ignored the orders. Harry had a soft spot for Wendy, so he let her continue reading. And instead, he went to the closet and dragged Robbie out. The boy was shaking, which had become typical for him. Harry barked orders at Robbie. I want you to wash those dishes. Robbie was so weak that it was hard for him to even stand, let alone do chores. Robbie had to hold his pants up with one hand as he pushed a chair to the sink. As he shook, he filled the sink with water and detergent and began dunking the dishes into the water. Poor little guy. Harry wasn't satisfied with this, how he was washing dishes. And so he said, those aren't clean, you dumbbell. And he forced the boy to wash the dishes over and over. Lana arrived home from her first day at work just after noon. And she walked in, kicked off her shoes, and laid down on the sofa because she was worn out. Mm -hmm. And um, instantly she was being shouted at by Harry. Don't flop down there. This place has to be cleaned up. That no good son of yours can't seem to get the dishes clean. I've had him washing them all morning. So, what? He expects Lana to be the only one working and then come home from a day of work and clean the house? This guy's such a worthless bum. Yeah, I think he's so strung up on the power that he has over this household that he, like, you know... He doesn't see himself the way Uh, normal people see themselves. Yeah, Yeah, he doesn't realize he's just a loser. He's just, like, strung up on this power, and now he's got to keep up the act to get these other people in line. You Uh, know? I don't know. That's that's how I'm perceiving this. Yeah, but thankfully, Lana, she did have a bit of a backbone, and she fired back at him. Where's that precious daughter of yours? What's she doing? Oh, good. I'm glad she can stick up for herself. Yeah. Then he shouted, Wendy Jo, get in here right now. And she got in there quickly and he scolded her. You're not much help to me today. I want you to get in that kitchen and wash those dishes. Tell the kid I want him to mop the hallway floor and the bathroom. Now move. And I'm sitting here thinking, what the heck does this guy do all day? Besides abuse these children, if he put half of the energy he puts into torturing Robbie into cleaning the house or getting a job, he wouldn't have this problem. It's not like he's working or anything. Well, he's just but like you said, different he's, ways to torture Robbie. I mean, there's yeah. no reason anymore. Like you said, he's obsessed with this power now. Mm-hmm. Wendy was somewhat crushed by her father's disapproval, and she quickly did what she was told. She walked around the house, collecting the rest of the dirty dishes scattered around the trailer. She caught Robbie drinking cola from a baby's bottle, against Harry's explicit rules. Having just disappointed her father, she was anxious and eager to get back into his favor, so even though she was usually on Robbie's side, she ran to doubt and tattled. So can we just pause and talk about the cola in the baby bottle? (laughs) I was thinking that while I read it. (laughs) Who the heck puts not only a terribly unhealthy and sugary drink into their baby's bottle, but it's cola? It's also caffeinated? I mean... They're giving their baby drugless sugar water. Drugless sugar water. I mean, that's what cola is. (laughs) 
Yeah, that kind of baffled me. <laughs> Now that I'm, I'm so used to this abuse of hearing all these terrible things. Yeah, nothing's like, surprising, but it's still like, yeah. why? Um. Anyways, Wendy tattled, and Harry comes stomping back to the bedroom, grabs Robbie by one arm, lifts him off the floor, and carries him into the living room. The boy is screaming, and he looks terrified. Lana's motherly instinct finally kicked in here, and she begged Dowd to leave him alone, but he was furious. He threw the boy to the floor, and as he landed, Robbie hit his head on a chair, and his screams stop abruptly. It was silent, and as he laid there, all the times before where Harry had knocked him down ran through their heads. Every time, the boy had gotten back up. But this time, he just laid there like a broken doll. Lana, Harry, and Wendy all sat staring at his little body for a long time. Right. Finally, Lana broke the silence, suggesting they take him to the hospital. But Harry replied, You know we can't do that. They'd ask too many questions. Doctor him yourself. This guy's such a selfish prick. This kid he just threw against a chair isn't moving, and he's still unwilling to take him to the doctor. Lana got down next to the boy and tried mouth to mouth, but she wasn't trained and most likely didn't do it properly. It didn't work. Then Dowd, true to his personality, threw cold water on the child, and this didn't work either. <sighs> Robbie was only six years old, and the hospital was less than three minutes away from the house. Medical help was readily available, but these awful people just let him lie there. Lana sat back on the sofa and began to cry softly. When Wendy realized what was happening, she began screaming. Harry, the cold-hearted and cruel man, who should have been a father to Robbie Wayne, asked the two women, What's the matter with you two? But then he realized what he had done. I am shocked now that they're flipping out and crying and sad because obviously this is what was going to happen to him. Yeah, where where did Lana think this was leading if she was going to go along with the abuse? But now I'm thinking, while well, I'm said, I said that, are they screaming and freaking out for themselves? <laughs> well, yeah, true. Not for him, but like they could be realizing, "Oh crap, we're going to get in big trouble if this gets out." Like what Wendy She's a kid, so I understand to an extent. But Lana, like, you're crying on the couch because you're realizing what's going to happen to you or because you realize what you did to your son? Yeah, I guess we can't say for sure. But, I mean, there's even the argument that maybe Lana was living in fear of Harry. But, I mean, she did just stand up to Harry, so mm -hmm. I don't think she feared him that much. But who knows? Wendy replied, He's dead. Robbie's dead. Then Harry sat stunned, unable to move or speak. Maybe hearing it out loud forced the reality of what he had done to finally sink in. Wendy went to her room and pulled a sheet off her bed. As she covered his body, Dowd said, I think we should turn ourselves in. We haven't got any choice. And this is strange. It's like like Harry Dow just had a 180 flip. It's like game over. Yeah, all of a sudden it's the totality of the situation and he's like, "Okay, let's get this taken care of." It's it's weird. It's shocking that he would want to go turn himself in. But Lana protested, saying it was too late to turn themselves in because Robbie was dead. She said, I think we should go ahead and bury him ourselves. They discussed it for a while, and she suggested a place she knew of in Texas where nobody ever goes. Her family had rented a run-down farmhouse there when she was a child. The house had been burned down and had never been fixed back up. It's so sad because while Robbie was alive, they just wanted him gone, it seemed like. But now that he was gone, he was an even bigger problem for them. And why do they want him gone? Because he couldn't count to ten. I mean, the whole this whole story just blows my mind of how things escalated. I know. 
They began selling things to raise some money for their road trip. They sold the crib, the baby carriage, blankets, toys, and even china cups that had been a family heirloom from Lana's grandmother. All that stuff only brought them $43 at a used furniture store. They used it to buy some food and a shovel. When they returned home, Harry was once again confronted by the fact of the dead child, and he had just collapsed into a chair and began to sob with his head in his hands. But Lana, who had always been tougher than him, continued with their plans. She and Wendy packed their clothes and gathered a few of their possessions. So really, I feel like they're switching places. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. It's like all of a sudden, that's Harry's weird. the one that feels bad. And and Lana's worried about how they're going to sing of themselves. Yeah. Um, they were eight days into the month and still hadn't paid the month's rent. So they waited until dark. Then stealthily, they loaded their car. On the last trip from the trailer, Lana carried the small boy wrapped in a sheet and placed him on the floor between the back seat. At this point, it's it's been a few days since he's been dead, right? Uh, I think it was just later in the the night. Oh, really? That they've sold all this stuff and all that? Yeah. Okay. Like, I was thinking the body starts to de- decay so fast. I wonder if he's... You know, yeah, I think this was all in one day. Not to be gross or anything, but they're in the car with like a dead body. Oh, it's probably like starting. I don't know if it starts to smell that fast, but either way, it's. Like, I think super it takes a couple days for it to start to stink, but <clears throat> I have no idea. Um, they drove for three hours until Lana directed Dowd off the main highway onto a series of unmarked back roads. Then they turned into a long driveway. There, they came upon ruins of Lana's old house. It was only faintly visible in the moonlight. Wendy and the baby were sound asleep, so Dowd and Lana got out of the car as quietly as possible. Lana walked over to a corner of the house where the section of the wall remained two feet off the ground and told Harry to dig there. I wonder if this was like a significant part of the house for her or if this was just a good spot. I think it might have been because that that was where most of the, like where the most of the house was still remaining. Mm. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But as we've discussed, Harry was a lazy bum who detested physical labor. And he had a hard time breaking the surva- the surface um, because it was caked and dry from a lack of rain. So his progress was slow as he pushed and pounded at the earth, mm-hmm. stopping a lot to rest. Oh, it take forever. And it took him three hours to dig a trench about four feet long, less than two feet wide, and 15 inches deep. Not deep enough. No. Lana later decided that that would be good enough. And she walked back to the car, opened the back door quietly, and cradled her child gently in her arms and walked over to the open grave. She teared up as she knelt down and set him gently in the dirt. After a long pause, she shakily stood up onto her feet and told Dow to start covering it back up. After almost an hour of him half-heartedly dumping piles of dirt and taking long rests, she took the shovel herself, and that's when she decided that she wanted to ditch this infantile 36-year-old parasite and start a new life. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's hard for me to even like feel bad for her, even though I know that she has her own problems and was most likely you know, being um, a victim of gaslighting and all that jazz. Well, but I'm just like the fact that it took her this long to realize yeah. what a piece of crap this guy was. Ooh, you get a medal. Like, you know, she should have like, realized this a year sooner. Yeah. Like as soon as he wanted to send her first kid away. Yeah, it's just it's hard to like you give a crap about how Lana's doing. Yeah. But as she was digging, she spotted an old refrigerator that was on the property, and she suggested they drag it over and set it on top of the grave to keep stray dogs from digging it up. Oh, how thoughtful. Instead of actually digging it six feet like like you usually well, do. I'm not even going to go there because usually. I'm glad that they mm-hmm. found him. But Harry mumbled about Lana breaking his back, so she helped him. But the fridge wasn't that heavy, so they added rocks And some other junk lying around to keep it weighed down. So, impulsively, 
Harry suggested that they move to a new place to get a new start. And he suggested Las Vegas. And Lana lashed on to this idea. She thought to herself, it's the nightlife capital of the world. And she knew she could find a job there as a dancer. And then she could follow through on her newly realized plan to ditch Harry. So they first drove to Fort Worth and sold off all their possessions for only $55. And then they sold their car for $250. Oh my gosh. What year is this? 77. Okay. Still. (laughs) Yeah. So they sold their car. They only got $250. Okay. And then they bought bus tickets to Las Vegas, which was a two-day bus ride. Hmm. When they got there, they found a modest hotel room and registered as Mr. and Mrs. Paul Black of Dallas. I wonder how long it took them to come up with that name. Uh, yeah, I, well, from what I read, I think it was a common um, alias that he used for oh, different okay. stuff. But. Okay. Then as soon as she could, Lana set out to look for a new job. She was quickly hired at the Blue Peacock as a topless beer, a topless beer joint. After working there for about four days, she wanted to move closer to work. So they found a motel on the other side of town that was near to her job and actually registered under his real name this time. But Harry began to have fits of jealousy as he would think about Lana dancing topless for other men. I mean, that's understandable. Yeah, it is. It's just funny. That's what he's worried about now. (laughs) Yeah, but she comforted him saying how much better money she was making. Apparently, it was double what she used to make um, at the cafeteria. And then she promised to call him every day at 5 o'clock during her dinner break. But shortly after that, she supposedly left to go to her job at the Blue Peacock. But instead, she took a bus to the other side of town and got a job at Aces and Deuces, which was just another bar. She got her own hotel room and registered under the, the name Alice Tillman, which... Tillman was her mother's maiden name, and then she went to work immediately. Hmm. Harry and Wendy sat by the phone, waiting for Lana to call until 10 p.m., but she forgot about her promise. Harry decided he was going to go find her, so he left Wendy and the baby at his motel room, and then he headed to the Blue Peacock where he thought she was working. He got himself worked up with rage on the way there, and he entered the joint ready to battle Lana's admirers. (laughs) That's funny. But she was nowhere to be found. The manager told him she hadn't come in that day and that she had left with one of the costumes, which was probably a big no-no. Yeah, Yeah, well, I'm guessing the costumes are pretty expensive. Then after this, Harry was confused, and he made his way back to the motel, and he didn't try to find Lana And shockingly, he also didn't try to look for work. Well, not shocking, but... (laughs) Yeah. He just stayed home and sobbed all the time. Lana never came back. And Wendy took the initiative to look over the situation and realized they only had $100 left, but they owed $75 to the motel. So she suggested they go live with her grandmother, and Harry agreed. Apparently... His whole life, his mother and sister had righted his wrongs and fixed things he had broken, basically cleaned up his messes. Wow. So, Mama's left her baby? Yeah. She's, like, completely lost it at this point. The more we learn about her, her, the more um, terrible she sounds as well. And the kid, Wendy, is now, like... A full-fledged adult making the decisions. Yeah, and she's only nine. Yeah. They sold a few more things and paid the motel bill, which I'm surprised they even paid the motel bill. You'd think that they'd just leave. Right. They were left with $36. They hitched a ride with Roger and Pamela Fielding, who had just won a lot of money in Las Vegas. They fed the family and gave them $20 as they parted ways. They reached Pecan Grove, on July 25th, around noon, 16 days after burying Robbie. Harry called his family, and they were delighted to hear from him and went to pick him up. A lot has happened in these 16 days. Yeah. A lot of life-changing events here. But that was nice of the Fieldings to give them a ride and give them money. 
Yeah, it was nice. They had no idea who they were shuttling around. Mm -hmm. Back in Vegas, Lana was happy to finally be rid of Harry. But only five days after starting to work at Aces and Deuces, what a stupid name. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) She started to feel the familiar morning sickness and extreme fatigue. They became overwhelming as she realized that she wasn't yet free of Harry Dowd. She stuck it out till the 27th of July. And then she asked for her paycheck and left. I just want to say aces and deuces that those are like uh, terms having to do with card games. I still hate it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, Lana called Marilee Tillman near Galveston who uh, welcomed her to come stay. And she got bus tickets again and took a three-day bus trip back to Texas. So Harry and Lana were both back in Texas, which neither of them knew the other one was there. But didn't they know, like, that Robbie existed? Well, you'd think that. The family dynamic here is just completely bonkers. So Harry and Lana were both back in Texas, which was the burial location of their horrible secret. Marlene Dowd Thompson and Joe Wilson, Harry's mother and sister, were so happy to have Harry, Wendy, and the baby. They didn't even remember that Robbie had ever lived. What? Ugh. One night well, while they were... Well, to be fair, this was Harry's mom and sister. I, okay. Which I she was... He was just Lana's boyfriend, so they probably never even met. Okay, that's a good point. Robbie. That's a good point. Um, One night, while they were playing a card game, along with four, six packs of beer, Harry lost three games in a row. Overwhelmed with emotion, he laid down his cards and started sobbing loudly. Then he spilled all the details of the murder and burial to his family. This is sad that this is the thing that gets him emotional, is losing three (laughs) games of cards. It's not funny. It's like... Insane how that's this is what triggered it. Yeah, cards. I don't know how to define it, but it's whatever it's actually makes us interested in talking about this kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, it's just bonkers. <laughs> but immediately they jumped to Harry's defense, which is shocking. But his mother worried about Lana going to the police and blaming Harry for everything. Harry said he didn't think she would do that, but quickly his sister said. That he was naive and that if Lana had it, or if Lana thought it would be to her advantage, she would call the police. I'm sure that the way, maybe the way Harry told them was like, it wasn't my fault. That's a good point. I mean, it has to be. There's no way he's like, I whipped him with this and then I pulled out his teeth and I starved him and then I killed him. And then I'd be like, well, it's okay. Yeah. There's no way. I did it because he wouldn't say his numbers correctly, so... Yeah. Just had to have, you know, he had to make it sweet on his side. Wow. The next day, August 1st, police received a call from an unidentified woman saying there was a dead child buried near Clinton. Then she hung up. Four days later, the police got a second call from a woman identifying herself as Lana Dowd which was odd because she only went by Lana Wood, never Lana Dowd. But this caller told them that a child was buried at a burned-out farmhouse near Clinton. Uh, I would imagine that this was probably Harry's sister pretending to be Lana Mm -hmm. to turn the suspicion on her. Because I don't think Lana would have gone to the police because it was her dirty secret as much as it was Harry's. But if she would have gone to the police, don't you think she would have used Harry's last name to make sure that he was brought up too? Maybe, but that would also associate him, associate her even closer with Harry. True. So, I don't know. We don't know because cause it was an anonymous caller. We obviously don't know. The police looked into burned down farmhouses around Clinton and found one that had the name Alice Tillman connected to it, and that she had a daughter named Lana. Immediately, they dispatched a group of investigators to search the property, and on August 5th, they found the badly decomposed remains of a small boy. So Alice Tillman is the mom, Mm -hmm. not Marilee. Oh, okay. 
I don't know who Marley is then. Okay. It didn't take police long to get both Harry and Lana in their custody. I think it's ironic that the mom and sister wanted to expose this whole thing in an effort to cover it up. I mean, if they wouldn't have called, it's likely no one would have ever known he was missing. But he was literally arrested the next day for it. (laughs) And I guess Child Protective Services did have him on their radar, but they hadn't done anything about what was going on for a while. So who knows? During interrogation, Harry rambled on, talking very freely about everything that had happened, but blamed Lana for everything. Similarly, Lana claimed to be a helpless pawn in the whole scheme of Harry Joe Dowd and that she feared him. Now, I personally would be inclined to believe Lana when she says this. Mm -hmm. Harry was the main instigator of all the abuse on the boy, though Lana did at times assist. But there's even more to this story. Oh. <laughs> but before... <laughs> the story is like insanely long. It's I know. Crazy. <laughs> Tell me about it. I have no one that wrote the outline. But first, let's discuss the trial. During Lana's trial, she seemed very charming, wearing a pink maternity dress, as she was pregnant at the time. Uh, Lana had claimed that she feared taking Robbie and leaving Dowd because of what he might do to the baby. But eventually she did end up leaving Harry, and she left the baby with him. Mm -hmm. So where did that fear go? We won't go into detail about the trial because of the time, but Lana got 12 years in prison. Mm -hmm. That doesn't... uh, I don't know if that's enough. Not well... I don't know. Yeah, this... The whole prison sentencing thing is so uneven across the board. It's, I don't even want to get started on it. But Dowd, on the other hand, originally pled not guilty. In his trial, Wendy actually testified, and she was really uncomfortable. She fidgeted a lot, wrung her hands, and wept openly. And when they asked her questions, she would look at her father and murmur, I don't know, or I don't remember. She looked at the floor a lot and had a really tough time answering the questions. But the jurors said that once she finished, they felt as if they'd been through the whole ordeal with her. Oh, poor kid. I feel like she's going to need therapy every day of her life now. I know. The next morning, Dowd changed his plea to guilty. He saw how tortured his daughter was up there, and he couldn't stand it. If only he would have had the same compassion for Robbie, or an ounce of the same compassion. I know. Six weeks later, the judge handed down the sentence, life in prison. Oh, that's more so fitting. happy that that is what he got. I know. That's what <sighs> he deserved. And I'm Lana, so glad that Wendy, she must have told it how it was yeah. for them to get enough details for life in prison. Mm-hmm. Well, and even if not, he did plead guilty to a murder. So. Mm-hmm. And we're in Texas. And, and yeah, he's lucky he didn't get killed. Mm-hmm. So... There was a baby that had been found that had two broken legs, a broken arm, and many lacerations and bruises. And the doctor said it looked like she had been flung repeatedly against a wall. Uh, mm -hmm. And the identity of this infant brings a whole new aspect to this case. This little victim was identified as Shirley Dolores Wood. This was the baby that was born to Lana while in prison. So, she must have been impregnated. I don't know if this was Harry's baby or not, but the baby went into the care of Lana's mother and sisters after it was born because Lana was in prison. And so... Wait a minute. I have a question for you. Was This was the baby she was pregnant with during court? Mm-hmm. During the trial? Yeah. How did the baby get all these wounds? Well, that's what I was just about to tell you, Rosie. Okay, sorry. I'm she, the baby, up. was living with the mom and the sisters. Oh. We don't have all the details of what happened, but they're the ones that did this to her. Harry's mom and sisters? No, Lana's mom and oh sisters. My God, everybody sucks in this story. Oh. I know. So this brought up the fact that Lana herself came from an abusive home. Uh. 
As they dug into her history, her father was an alcoholic who let out his frustrations from hard work by beating his wife and three daughters. And as we often discuss, people are much more likely to perpetrate abuse if they've been abused themselves. And Lana's sister and mother were the ones abusing this poor little infant. Sadly, abuse can be a lifestyle that's often handed down from one generation to the next. And here at Voice of the Victim, it is our passion and dream to help end the cycle of abuse. Even though we know it's an impossible task, we hope to at least make a small difference in the lives of someone by raising awareness and helping more people be alert to the signs of abuse so we can all be empowered to speak up when we see something suspicious. And I don't want to pick on the family again from the rest stop, but if they would have done something, anything, about the little boy they suspected wasn't being treated well, it could have saved his life. And you remember the landlord at the trailer park who saw Wendy carrying the emaciated boy? Later he would comment that if he could ever do it over again, he would report Robbie Wayne's case to the authorities, even though he had little to go on except for instinct. The landlord said, It would be better to be wrong 100 times than to fail a child like Robbie Wayne and to have to live with the failure the rest of your days. Boom, boom. Do you want to cut it off there or do you want to talk a little bit? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Let's have some music come in and then I'll play our outro. Okay. So thank you for listening to this episode of Voice of the Victim podcast. Take a deep breath. Be happy for what you have. And give a hug to your little ones. Yeah. This this story was hard to read. It really makes you think about what could be going on around us. I mean, we don't want to be unnecessarily paranoid, but we do want to keep an eye on, mm-hmm. on these kind of things because... They're, even if they're in a rough situation now, it could get worse for them and it could possibly be prevented. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. would you rather be embarrassed because you are wrong about a child being abused or, you know, or save their life? Save a life? Yeah. Oh, not all of our stories are going to be as gruesome and cruel as this one. Yeah, but... But it was a good story to cover because it's something that really happened. Mm. And obviously this little boy, like, you know, deserves his story to be told. Yeah. So, again, we want to thank you for listening. Um, If you enjoy our show or if you think what we're doing is good, uh, please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And uh, let us know what you like about the show or what we could do better. And... Also, you can follow us on Instagram at VOV Podcast and Twitter at VOV Pod. You can email us at VOV Podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we uh, are going to have somebody tell their own story about their own abuse um, next week. Next week. And we'd really appreciate it if there's any other people out there who want to share their story. They don't have to say their real name if they don't want to. They come up with a name they've always wanted to have. <laughs> uh huh. Um, you don't even have to say your story. You can email it to us if you're nervous about talking on air. So, Yep. And uh, you can also, if you really enjoy our show, you can support us on Patreon for just a dollar a month or whatever you want to give to us and uh, help us keep making the show. And so thanks again for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Go check out the Murderific Podcast. That's Murderific. Available today at the website Murderific.com. Also on Podbean. The Murderific Podcast is just a girl from the scary state of Maine with a serious love of true crime. This podcast is about serial killers, mass murderers, familicides, and more. Stream today at Murderific.com. M-U-R-D-E-R-I-F-I-C. Murderific.com. You can also follow the show on Instagram at Murderific Podcast. The Murderific Podcast at Murderific.com, also available on Podbean, executing podcasts one crime at a time. Go check it out now.